uh, what I wanted to talk about, one of the one of the things Jolly asked me to talk about was uh, progress monitoring. First off, what I wanted to do was explain why I use the term bulletproofing your IEP. Um, as uh, we heard, and my area of interest has always been in special education law. Particularly, I've been interested in how do we as educators write IEPs that are legally correct and educationally appropriate. Because the, the kind of the, the central, part, central uh, requirement of the law, of the idea is that all the program, the programs that we write for our students confer what is, or the, I should say the IEP, IEPs that we write for our students must confer what we call a meaningful educational benefit and that defines a FAPE. Or a FAPE count, uh, is a free appropriate public education. That's what our charge is as special educators, to write an education that confers FAPE, which of course is defined as meaningful educational benefit. So how exactly do we do that? That's the big question. Now I always spend a lot of time reading due process hearings and reading court cases and over the past few years about 90 percent of all court cases have involved the question of fate. That is whenever there's a due process hearing, a dispute between parents and school districts that can't be settled in the IEP process or through the regular processes it winds up going to due process hearing or a court. 90% of those involve questions of fate. Free appropriate public education. Well what exactly does that mean? Um, that means it, the law itself is pretty ambiguous. It just says fate is any, an education that meets state standards and is developed in accordance with the IEP. So not a lot of, and it's free, not a lot of information. But what the courts have done is they've developed a more of a, a definition of FAPE. And essentially a FAPE is two things. According to the United States Supreme Court, a FAPE consists of two things. One thing it consists of is following the procedural requirements of the law, which we all know procedural requirements are sending out notices, having all the IEP team members present, involving the parents in meaningful discussions. Uh, those are kind of procedural aspects of the law. And then there, the Supreme Court said, well, there's also su substantive or content aspects of the law. And what the content aspects of the law are, is, m means, is that we must provide an education that confers meaningful educational benefit. In fact, the, in 2004, in the idea, Congress said if, that if our IEPs actually confer benefit, meaningful benefit, we can prove it, that even trumps procedural mistakes. We can, still, we can make procedural mistakes and we're still okay as long as our IEPs really confer benefit on the child. So that's important to remember, procedural and content requirements. As, I, as special educators, as IEP team members, we're responsible for meeting procedural requirements and content requirements or substantive requirements. Now, um, like I said, about 95% of all cases are FAPE. And FAPE cases always boil down to what's in the IEP, always. Um, and so IEPs are very important. It's important that we write IEPs that confer benefit, that are legally correct, and um, actually it's also very important that we can prove that our IEPs confer benefit. If we can prove that, we virtually cannot lose in a court or a hearing. We virtually have a bulletproof IEP as long as we prove that we are actually effective. And of course the ultimate winner is, is the child. Because if we can prove we're effective, well that means we were effective and the child has achieved meaningful educational benefit. Now, um, I talked about this in my last session, and this is kind of a, it's sort of bird walking, but it's sort of not. Um, there was a series of cases in the 80s uh, where school districts were suing schools 
or parents who are suing school districts because over something called lo, called LOVAS tra training or LOVAS programming. Does anybody know what that is? Okay, LOVAS programming is a method of educating youngsters with autism, very young children with autism. It's based on applied behavior analysis. It's known to be very effective. Applied behavior analysis is known as being very effective with kids with uh, autism who have autism with other uh, behavioral issues too, like um, kids with behavioral disorders. Now, one of the things we know from the law is any time that there's what's called a methodology dispute, that is the parents say, we have a method that we want you to use, and the school says, bah, we have this method that we're going to use. Anytime there's a dispute that goes to a hearing or a court case about methods, the school always wins because it's up to school districts to determine the methods by which you educate youngsters with disabilities. Well, in about the 80s, like I said, eh, no, 90s, 90s, late 90s, not late 80s, there was a series of cases in which parents were suing school districts regarding over FAPE uh, because they want, and they were asking school districts either to train teachers and to provide LOVAS training, LOVAS programming for the youngsters, or provide LOVAS trainers to train them in their home environment. Which, that's a pretty expensive proposition. Probably uh, LOVAS, LOVAS uh, says 40 hours of uh, discrete trial training uh, per week, and with a, a certified trainer, that comes to about 80 grand a year. So schools aren't really anxious to do that. Um, so they would tend to say, no, we don't, we're not going to go into your homes and provide LOVAS training. We have another research-based strategy uh, that we use, but we use it at school. And so what happened is parents would sue. And they'd want either the school to provide lowest training or, or do it at home. Well, they shouldn't do, schools shouldn't lose in a case like that. Because it boils down to methods. It boils down to the parents saying, we want you to use LOVAS, and schools saying, no, we use X. So schools should win. Because courts always decide methodology cases for school districts. But in the late 90s, all of a sudden, there was a whole spate of cases where school districts were losing time and time and time again in these LOVAS cases. And so a colleague and I thought, well, this is kind of interesting. Why, should they, why are they losing? They shouldn't be losing their methods cases. It seems the parents are saying we have a better method, and the courts say school districts should win then. So what is the, what, what's the, why are they losing? So we went and we read all these cases. We found out the reason they were losing is not because they didn't provide LOVAS. It was because they had no data to show that they were effective. They could not prove effectiveness of their program. And any time there's a fake case, uh, a court is going to say, number one, school, were you effective? And number two, parents, was, you, was what you did effective? And if the school isn't effective, but the parents were effective, the parents are going to win. So they weren't winning LOVAS cases because they used LOVAS. They were winning LOVAS cases because LOVAS collects a lot of data. And they could prove that they were benefiting the kids where the schools could not prove that. That was, my, that was the first indication that it's very important that we have data that shows our programs are really benefiting kids. So that is why I call bullet, why I say it's bulletproofing, because if you have that data, you can't lose. Outside of a few things, like, like forgetting to invite the parents to IEP meetings, um, writing the IEP by yourself and not including parents, you can literally not lose. You have a, a virtually a bulletproof IEP if you can approve, prove effectiveness. That kind of reminded me of Alice and the Cheshire Cat. You remember Alice goes up to the Cheshire Cat in Adventures in Wonderland and says, would you tell me please which way I ought to go from here? The cat says, that depends a good deal on where you want to go. She says, I don't much care. And then the cat says, then it doesn't matter which way you go. It's kind of the same way 
in special education. If we can't collect some data that shows benefit, we might as not, we, we may as well not be, uh, we don't know which way we're going. We don't know if our programs are effective and if we go to a court or go to a hearing and we can't prove that, we may lose. So, what I'm going to talk about is progress monitoring. And there's a lot to progress monitoring, so I want to just kind of give you a general idea of how it works um, and what it's all about. First, this is, there's a center. Uh, the U.S. Department of Education has a number of uh, offices within the U.S. Department of Education. One of them's called the Office of Special Education Programs, or OSEP. They had a center on progress monitoring. So it's not being funded anymore. But the way they define progress monitoring is it's a scientifically based practice that's used to assess um, a student's academic and functional performance and evaluate the effectiveness of instruction. Progress monitoring, and so what the, U the U.S. Department of Education essentially did is uh, they had a grant, this center, for about uh, five years and five, six million dollars uh, worked on developing the most effective ways that we as teachers can monitor student progress. In fact, they still have a website. If you put Center on Progress Monitoring in Google, you'll go, to, you'll go to the website. One of the things they showed is that progress monitoring, and forget for a second that it bulletproofs your IEP, uh, it accelerates student learning. We know that when we monitor student progress, that students learn more. These are some, just some folks, uh, Lynn and Doug Fuchs of Vanderbilt, uh, Amy Rushley, Todd Bush, folks from Minnesota, and Marzano. These people have studied what difference does progress monitoring make. And what they find is that progress monitoring makes a huge amount of difference in what, how much kids learn. In fact, um, these three studies essentially showed that teachers that use progress monitoring, their students achieve on the average almost a full standard deviation more than students of teachers who don't. Now, if you're familiar with a standard de deviation, you know, oh, that's pretty good, that's a lot. If you're not, you're all probably familiar with the, like tests like the Woodcock-Johnson and things like that. Standard deviation is almost an entire grade level on the Woodcock-Johnson. That teachers who use these different types of progress monitoring, their kids achieve that much more than kids of teachers who don't use it. Also, um, and the reason is, is because we always know where our kids are. And are they learning or are they not? This is a graph from these studies, this shows no progress monitoring. If uh, on a standard scale, no progress monitoring in the Fuchs study, that's the difference. Which again is almost a whole grade level between teachers who don't use it and teachers that do use it. And then Rashley, even they even found more. So there's an incredible amount of difference uh, in terms of just how much progress students can make. So if you look at that kind of is the, the line of uh, just sort of to demonstrate what the difference is between some sort of progress monitoring system and when we don't use a progress monitoring system. So we know that it, it's, it does show progress. I mean if you have programs that show progress, you have a bulletproof IEP, it can't be assailed, and also kids are going to learn more. Now, um, also, one of the things, all the cases in FAPE, and like I said, about 95% of all case law in special ed is on FAPE, pretty much all boils down to accountability. Can we actually show uh, progress? Additionally, uh, benefits of monitoring progress, you're much more likely to be able to communicate uh, with families and one of the things that these studies have shown is that teachers who monitor progress have higher expectations of their kids. Of course, an additional reason is it's law. The law since 1975 
has required some sort of evaluation. Um, back when IDEA was first became law, the, the law talked about essentially what we call summative evaluation. That we should do an evaluation uh, at the beginning of the year and uh, at the end of, uh, of instruction. Now, when I was, I was a teacher in Minnesota, we used to have to fill out a form on every kid that we had in special education. At the time, I was a teacher of youngsters with learning disabilities. And the form looked like this. We have the name of the child. We have date of pretest. Date of post test. And then we had a graph. And it looked just like this. And we had to give everybody, every kid that I had in my learning disabilities classroom, a test called the RAP, the Wide Range Achievement Test. Anybody familiar with that? Okay, I think it's in the RAT 3 now, or it's 4? Four, four? Okay, well, this is back in the RAT 1. Um, and beside being one of the most unfortunately, unfortunate acronyms ever, uh, the RAT, it was also not a particularly good test. It's probably better now, but it was divided into subtests. There was reading recognition, comprehension, spelling, math, like that. So we would have to give every kid the RAT, reading, rec uh, comprehension, spelling, math. Then, we had to write down the date of the pretest, and we had to put their scores in here, and every one we did. Didn't matter what the, if the child was a whiz in math and could do reading, we had to put them all down. And so let's say little Johnny had a 3.0 in reading. Okay, then we teach them all year long, and this, by the way, was required in my school district. It was suggested by the state of Minnesota. And then we'd teach them all year long. And the end of the year, we'd give them a post test. So I'd get all my little kids, and over the last two weeks, I'd give them all the rat again. Every one of them. And then I'd go back to my chart, and we'd say, okay, how did little Jimmy do in reading recognition? Well, I got a 3.2. And then the last thing I did, last column, was called change score. And so what I'd have to do then is take the first score he got, look at the second score, figure out what the difference was, and that would be his growth for a year. So let's say he went 2.2. Okay, that's, now, like I said, everybody was, we all did that in Minnesota. Every teacher did that. Can you see some real problems with that? Well, there's a couple of real problems with it. Number one is that's an inappropriate way to use a group achievement test. You can't take one score and subtract another and get growth. It just doesn't work that way. Um, but the other problem was, and it didn't take me long to figure this out, and I think a lot of other people, is, well, what if this was really true? And what if after a year of teaching, Jeremy only gained two months in one year? What would that mean? Is that good? No. That's not particularly good. What can I do? Nothing. I can't do anything about that. Because the year's gone already. What I needed was, what would really help is a way to assess Jeremy's progress throughout the school year. And that's in fact what happened when IDEA was reauthorized in 1990. Um, in 1997. They said that teachers must collect data on a, on a, at, at least as often as general education kids get report cards. And that data has to be reported to the student's parents that frequently. And that's what this is about. It's about progress monitoring. It's about saying we're going to monitor the progress of a child during the course of instruction so if, if the child is not learning during the school year, 
I can, I can still do something. If I find out, I, excuse me, I, have, I find out after four weeks that Jeremy is not learning, well, I can still do something about it. It's a lot better than that model where I have to wait till the end of the year to find out that he wasn't learning anything. So that's what I mean when I say it's, it's the law. Now, when the law was, our law, the idea, goes through a process called reauthorization. About every five or six years it gets amended, gets changed a little bit. Got changed again in 2004. Got changed in 1990 and 1997 and then 2004. Well, in 2004, Congress really started to emphasize this idea of progress monitoring. In a congressional report on what at that time was called the Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act, and now it's just part of the idea, they, the Congress said the purpose of the 2004 reauthorization was to improve educational results for youngsters with disabilities and to assess and ensure the effectiveness of education for children with disabilities. So just think about the name of the law it passed in 2004. The Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act. It was about improving results for youngsters with disabilities. And how did Congress say you do that? Well, they said there's a couple ways, a couple things we need to do to make sure we improve results. And one of those ways is to use constant progress monitoring during the school year. In fact, at least again, as often as general education students get report cards. So we like have uh, an idea of is our teaching working or not? So, it's the law. Here's a few more comments on idea regulations. This one, by the way, this, this first one, that was another change they made to try to improve the law. They emphasized for the first time using research-based strategies. And they said, these requirements emphasize the importance of using high-quality research-based instruction in special education settings consistent with No Child Left Behind. Then, this statement. This system, they talked about uh, the, the idea and the IEP. They said this system, if we're going to improve kids, improve results for kids with disabilities, will require evidence in the form of database documentation reflecting formal assessment of progress during instruction through repeated assessments. That's exactly what progress monitoring is. Congress is saying, that's what we have to do. We have to monitor student progress. We take that, combine it with the court cases, where the courts are saying, we need to prove educational progress. If we can prove educational progress, we have a bulletproof IEP. Now, a couple other things about what constitutes progress monitoring. Courts have said there's things that definitely, I mean, there's a lot of different ways of progress monitoring, and, and I'll just talk about a few of them. And I know Matt and, and Pete, I was looking at their, they did a, a real nice presentation on progress monitoring that talks about the different types, and we'll get into that. But one thing that doesn't count as progress monitoring is teacher observation. Determination, this is again from, from the U.S. Department of Education regulations. Determination of student achievement will require evidence in the form of database documentation reflecting formal assessment of progress during instruction through repeated assessments. See, there's nothing in that statement about observation. It says database documentation. That's what the law says. This is what one court said. It was from a case called Rio Rancho Public Schools. It was actually heard by the New Mexico State Educational uh, Agency. Um, it said, the student, in this particular case, an IEP, there was, a, again, as most cases, it was a FAPE case. It was about free appropriate public education. The school district, the due process hearing officer, in this particular case, threw out two years of IEPs because he said the IEPs did not confer free appropriate public education. Why? Well, 
the, after the due process, New Mexico as a system doesn't go right to the federal courts or the courts, it goes to the state educational agency. And they ruled in favor of the hearing officer. And they said the reason was the IEPs were thrown out is the students' annual goals and objectives in each of these two years of IEPs simply did not contain objective criteria which permit measurement of student progress. A goal of increasing reading comprehension skills or improving decoding skills is not a measurable goal. These IEPs, they would have things like, uh, Jeremy will improve his reading. That was a goal. Or Jeremy will improve his reading comprehension or reading decoding skills. It's very kind of ambiguous goals that did not have really any end point in sight. It just said, he's going to get better. And the court said, that's not good enough. That is not good enough. Um, even if the present levels of performance were clearly stated, according to the educational agency, including an open-ended statement that the student will improve does not meet the requirement for a measurable goal. Why? Because it's not measurable. You can't measure that. If I said um, a child, is someone's going to lose weight, if I didn't have a, a target, how do you know if they lost the prop, uh, an appropriate amount of weight? And the same thing with reading. We're going to improve reading. Well, how much? They didn't say, thus the IEPs were ruled invalid. Did not provide faith. This is uh, from a different case uh, involving an IEP that was declared to be invalid. This was actually um, at a state, uh, in a state court uh, because the, an IEP oh, was written that in where it said, how will you measure this? They said teacher observation. That's all. It just said teacher observation. And the court said that although subjective teacher observation provides valuable information, teacher observation is not an adequate method of monitoring student progress because without supporting data, observation is opinion which cannot be verified. Another quote, if from a case, this was out of West Virginia, if an IEP fails to assess the child's present level of performance, the IEP does not comply with the idea. This deficiency goes to the heart eye of the IEP. The child's level of academic achievement and functional performance is a foundation on which the IEP must be, must be built. Without a clear identification of present levels, the IEP team cannot measure goals, they cannot evaluate student progress, or determine educational services. So it's real clear now, in terms of the law, we need to be assessing student progress. We need that to be able to show that we're providing a FAPE. We need that to ensure that kids are actually growing, that they're actually improving. So legally, it is required. Now, anyone who's interested in improving the educational results of students with disabilities should be using progress monitoring. Doesn't matter if you're a general ed teacher or special ed teacher, we've got to have ways to monitor our students' progress. Now, the good news is there's a whole bunch of really simple, user-friendly ways in which we can monitor progress. But essentially what we're doing, and these are what the courts have said, Essentially, progress monitoring indicates whether the things we're doing, our teaching strategies, our teaching procedures, which like the cause, are they resulting in satisfactory academic growth? That would be the effect. If we can show an effect, if we can show academic growth, we're meeting the requirements of the law. We're creating a bulletproof IEP. Now, um, <clears throat> the big question is if we know that progress monitoring increases in stu student achievement, we know it's required by the law, <clears throat> we, know, excuse me, we know it's a research-based best practice, what would stop us from implementing progress monitoring? The one thing that would probably would stop us is not having a real easy to use, simple way of doing it. Because te as teachers, we're extremely busy folks. And we have to have a really efficient and easy way to monitor student progress. 
So what I'm going to do here is we're just going to go uh, through a few different types. And we're not going to talk about all these, but I'm just going to explain some things. And again, going back to Matt and Pete's um, uh, presentation on progress monitoring, they talked some more about these different types of methods. But there are three basic ways that we can monitor student progress. And one of the ways is through what we call mastery measurement. Mastery measurement, if, has anybody ever, well, I'm sure we have some math teachers here. Uh, if you use a basal math text, what is at the end of every chapter, what is usually included in a math curriculum? A test to see if the child met the, met the objectives of that particular unit. That's essentially what mastery measurement is. It's giving a test to a child to see if they met the objectives of a unit. You know, we do it in social studies, we do it in spelling, we do it in math. That's, that's mastery measurement. And that's one way to collect progress monitoring data. Another way is called curriculum-based assessment. That's where you have curriculum that includes a test, or you make a test up based on, on the particular curriculum that you use. That's another way to do it. But the way I want to spend a little time talking about, and I think probably one of the easiest ways to do it, is by using something called general outcome measurement, or GOM, people call it. Now the thing about mastery measurement and curriculum-based assessment is they measure little chunks of curriculum. So if we have it in our math book, we do say, uh, have a unit on subtraction, um, certain type of subtraction or division. At the end of that unit, we'll have a test to see if they m mastered that particular unit. And most tests, commercially provided tests, have a figure like they have to have 80% right in order to show mastery. Okay, that is how mastery measurement works. It breaks curriculum into little tiny chunks. You teach a chunk, you test it. Teach another chunk, you test it. That's progress monitoring. But it doesn't tell us if little Johnny's becoming better at math altogether. It tells us if he's learning these little chunks. Curriculum-based assessment's the same way. Let's say we have uh, social, so we're teaching social studies, and we have a unit test at the, we make a unit test at the end of every unit. It tells us if they've mastered that content. This is a whole different ball game, though. This doesn't tell us if the child is becoming better at doing a certain type of addition. This tells us if a child is becoming better at math, generally becoming better at math. Okay, if we do say mastery measurement in, is anybody familiar with the Orton Gillingham reading? Okay, they have, you can give tests of uh, say, on, say you're teaching diphthongs or something. You give a test at the end, end of the unit, you teach on diphthongs or digraphs or whatever you are to see if the child has mastered that skill. That will tell us that, yes, the child has progressed in that way. He can do diphthongs. Does it tell us if he's becoming a better reader? No. This tells us if he's becoming a better reader. Because what this type of measurement does is it measures a child's overall reading ability. <clears throat> now, any type of these three, these are, these are something we want in any type of progress monitoring system. Number one, we want them to be reliable and valid. Because you go into a court and you're questioned about a particular type of curriculum or an assessment, that's one of the things we have to do. We, we have to know if, it, if what we're doing really means what we said it means. You know, if you look at an idea, when it talks about assessment, it talks about reliable assessment, valid assessment. So we want these procedures we use to be reliable and valid. Well, that's a problem a little bit with mon mastery measurement because we don't know if doing things in little chunks like that are actually valid and reliable. But that's one thing we want. Another thing we want is we want to make certain that whatever we're doing, it's sensitive to growth. 
Because that's really what we want to find out. We want to find out if children are actually benefiting from our instruction. And so in order to find that out, we have to know that our instruments are sensitive to growth. Now, look at back at this I did back in the late 70s, our method Minnesota. If we did this, is this sensitive to growth? Not even close, not even close. Because the best thing we can say at the end of the year is, oh gee, Jeremy, he didn't learn anything this year. I hope he does better next year. Um, but we can't use that data, to, we can't use that information to make changes during the course of instruction. And again, that's what progress monitoring is all about. It's making, it's monitoring a child during the course of instruction so we can determine if a child is actually benefiting. Another thing we need is it's got to be easy to do. Because teachers are busy folks, we can't spend a lot of time in assessment because we're teaching, uh, we're teaching multiple areas, possibly multiple uh, levels. We have to have something that is pretty darn time efficient. We can't be spending an hour a day on monitoring progress, which there are procedures out there that take that long. So we want to have something that's real quick. We want to have something we can do over and over again. How many of you have given the Woodcock Johnson? Or, or the key math, or any test like that? Do you know how often they're repeatable? About every six months. Because there's a practice effect. You, give it, you can't give it every week because they, it's not repeatable. We need measures that are repeatable. Something we can give time and time again. And that's going to be required that our actual, what we give is a little bit different every time. And, and I'll explain more about that in a second. Next, we want something easy to administer. I want to be able to sit down with a child uh, with at most a paper and a pencil and give them a two minute test, done. Easy to administer. I taught, like I said, I taught for 16 years in Minnesota and now I use the type of monitoring called, which is called general outcome measures or GOM and when I first, when I was teaching, we had 16 uh, kids with emotional disabilities in the class. And so, obviously, when you have that many kids and there's me and another aide, your time is pretty precious. Uh, and so you need something pretty easy to administer. So what we use is, is these general outcome measures. Uh, in reading, for instance, I used a procedure called just counting oral reading fluency. Very simple to, to do. Could do it in a minute for each child. Um, easy to teach train. It should be easy for teachers to do and easy, we, we need to have systems that can be easily trained. Now, I was around, I was getting my master's degree at St. Cloud University back when they had a procedure called precision teaching. Has anybody heard of that? You're too young, you probably haven't heard about it. But it was difficult. It was very difficult to do. It was time consuming. But the hardest part is it just, it was so difficult to do that, you know, it would take a whole semester to learn how to do it. Um, we need to have something that is done real easy and um, something that we can train teachers on very quickly. Bless you. Now, how do we implement progress monitoring? There's, there's a way, there's a, a kind of a format, regardless of what system we use, that we need to follow in implementing progress monitoring. Number one, we have to know where the child is before we start teaching. That's our baseline. That's the assessment. In IEP, uh, when we do IEPs for kids, we, have te we give tests. I'm not talking generally about those type of tests we give, about Woodcock Johnson's, about WISCs, but more about informal teacher-made tests, things that we can make up relatively easily. And uh, the good news is there's a ton of really easily accessible stuff on the internet now that's free that we'll go into. Another thing is we have to decide 
what rate of improvement we want for our kids. We'll get into this a little bit later. We need a way to collect data. We need a measurable annual goal. That, of course, is required in the IEP. We need to have a, some way of keeping track of where the child is. And what we know, the most efficient way to keep track of data is to graph it. And we need to have some decision-making rules, something that tells us when our teaching isn't working. We've got to do something different. So I know you've all seen a picture of a graph. This is an example of a graph. Um, as I said, when I did reading for kids, I used a type of reading uh, general outcome measurement called oral reading fluency. That just means I would have a child read to me for a minute and count the number of words they read correct. And I graph it. So on, on this axis, I have correctly uh, read words per minute. On that axis, weeks of instruction. And every week, I would, give, I would do a measurement, or actually two or three times a week, and I'd graph it. So if Jeremy was re read 40 words this week, I'd put a little dot there. If next, next week he read 50, I'd put a little dot there. And then he read 47, and then he read 60. Put all those little dots, and then I'd connect them with a, with a line. And there I have a, that would be my graph. Now. It's easy to graph student scores on teacher-made graphs. All you do is make a graph for each student and chart how they're doing. Now, I'm going to show you how this is done in, in using oral reading fluency. Number one, going back. In general outcome measures, remember what we do is the first thing we do is we gather information on the student's current level of performance. And that actually can be put in our present levels statement in our IEP. The second thing we need to do is we need to determine what kind of growth do we want to see over the year. Determine the student's rate of growth and we can write a measurable annual goal based on that. And then every week we give a one minute test of oral reading fluency Count the words the child gets correct per minute. Put it on the graph. Boom. That's it. We're done. That is the most effective way that we know of and most efficient, valid, and reliable way to collect data on reading ability. Ask a kid to read to you for one minute. Count the words they read correct. Put it on a graph. And keep a tally of the graph. And if you see the child, if, let's say we have a graph that looks like this. Remember, that's our correct words per minute. These are our weeks. Let's say we have a graph that looks like this. And we've decided that where we want, say, 60 words per minute. Uh, we want the child to be able to read 60 words per minute at the end of the year. And we're testing them. And let's see, he started, and I'll show you how to do this. We have a baseline of here. And he's going like this. And we connect these dots. What does that tell us? If we look at our goal, do we think Jeremy is going to meet their reading goal? Probably. He's going, they're going on an upward trajectory. They're getting there. Uh, so it looks good. That, is all, that's, that gives us information. We know that our instruction is working. On the other hand, what if we had figures like this? Does it look like he's going to? No. Doesn't look good. We need to make a, a change in instruction. Has anybody, has anybody here ever been a child? Yeah. Has anybody here ever been a parent? Any, we got some parents. Maybe you know what that you know what that is? That's the most intuitively understandable graph by a parent in the world. That's a growth and height chart. Every pediatrician has one of these. Bring your little baby in, they measure their head circumference. They measure they weigh them. They measure their length and they compare them to this because this this is 
average developmental growth. If your child is on the 50th percentile, they will be right here. If they're in the, if they're in the like 95th percentile, here. 80th percentile, you know. So that's what a pediatrician does to measure a child's developmental growth. They just take all these measurements and compare them to what they know the average kid does. Now, I want you to look at the way that this kind of the gr natural growth in terms of height and weight, how it grows like this in a very steady progression. Now, this is really interesting. Look at this. This is developmental growth in words read correct in kids from first grade to sixth grade. Look at that. They look kind of kind of similar, don't they? There's very similar developmental growth. These are kids at the 50th percentile. First grade, how many words they re read in one minute correctly? in second grade and third grade and fourth grade and then it starts uh, bottom sort of flattens out a little bit these are at the 75th percentile these are the 25th percentile so if you have a child in second grade who has a learning disability have them read you orally for one minute you can compare them on a graph like this and tell developmentally how they're doing well that's important but what is really important is you can use that data to tell you, is Johnny learning? Is he learning to read? And if you find that you have data like that, clearly it's working. If you have data like that, something needs to change. You need to change instruction in some way and to continue to collect the data. So that, that's one of the things. Um, the trick is learning what to measure. Like I said, this, this is oral reading fluency. That's having a child read for one minute and counting the words read aloud. That is one of the best measures we have of reading growth. It correlates with comprehension, reading recognition, uh, phonemic awareness, it correlates with everything. And that's like the easiest thing you can do. Ask a child to read for a minute. Count the words read correct. Now, um, you ever been to a doctor? What happens when you go into a doctor? Well, let me, let me put it this way. I had, a, I had a, a problem with my knee a couple years ago, so I went to the doctor. What's the first thing they do when you go to a doctor? Weigh you, blood pressure, heart rate, pulse, all those kind of things. Now, that didn't have a lot to do with my knee, but the doctor does them anyway. You know why they do that? Because that doc, my doctor is a baseline of my physical health. And even though I'm coming in talking about my knee, if suddenly my blood pressure is up through the roof, he knows to do something about it. He knows that something has to be done. In a sense, well, we're going the wrong way. In a sense, that's what oral reading fluency is. It's like a vital sign of a student's educational health, of a student's reading health. And by the way, I'm talking about oral reading fluency today. You can do it in math. You can do it in spelling. There are methods, ways to do this in science. There's being developed ways to do this in secondary. But it's like a vital sign. If I see that the re he's really having problems with his oral reading fluency, that's my alert. My instruction isn't working. I've got to do something. I've got to make some kind of change. Now I'm going to give you an example of uh, second grade. This, you can do this with any grade. Uh, this is general outcome measurement. Uh, it used to be called curriculum-based measurement. Essentially, every week, every student reads aloud from the, say I'm doing this with a second grader or a fourth grader. Each week, each week every student reads aloud from a second grade reading passage for one minute. The, each reading passage has to be about the same difficulty. Why, why would that be important? That would be important because what if I give them a first grade reader one week and a sixth grade reader the next? Well, I'm not going to get any kind of accurate measurement because clearly he's going to have a harder time with the sixth grade reader than the first grade reader. Or if I gave him a 
fourth grade reader and then next week give them a first grade reader, it's going to score a lot better because it's easier, easier to read. So I've got to give them passages on about the same level of difficulty. As the student reads, I just mark the errors he makes. Count the number of words that the child reads correctly and then graph the scores. Now note a couple things here. I'm, oh, what I'm looking for is I want these scores to go up. If the scores are going up on the general outcome measure, that indicates to me that the kid is becoming a better reader. And like I said, oral reading fluency, it, people say, well, wait, aren't you just reading words? What does that have to do with, say, comprehension or, or uh, fluency or anything? Well, it does have something to do with fluency, with phonemic awareness. Well, what we know is oral reading fluency. Remember, reliability, validity, oral reading fluency is the best way to measure growth in reading there is. It's better than giving the Woodcock Johnson. It's better than giving the Stanford Reading Comprehension Test. It's a very accurate way of measuring reading ability. And it's very sensitive to growth. Now, student scores are going down. I know I have to change. If they're kind of flat, I also know. Let's say they're, uh, they're like this. Does that tell me I need to make a change? Yeah. It's flat and he needs to be growing. You know, I have his goal up here. He's not growing, so I need to make an instructional change. So in other words, what we do, just to review, is we have our words read per minute, we have our weeks, we have our starting point, that's called a baseline, and, you, and we need to do like three, if, at the beginning of the year, if we do three measures, that gives us a baseline, three measures, five. You do an odd number of measures of have Jeremy read orally for me three different times, graph that, you know, what's the middle score, the median score, and then I can figure out what I want for a goal, and then I just keep on, ask him to read for one minute, and, and graphing where he is. Now if I look at that, I would say, oh boy, he's doing great. He's above where he needs to be and he seems to be going up at a pretty good pace. My instruction is working. And although I'm talking about reading, there's measures, uh, GOM measures in spelling, in writing, in mathematics. You know, the best method we know for, for measuring writing ability this will come as a shock to you. Ask the kid to write. Say, give him a story starter. Um, one dark and stormy night, I went outside and saw. Now I'll think about that for a minute and write for three minutes. And then count the words they read, uh, wrote correctly. That's the best way to measure writing ability. So very simple. It's, not, it's, it's easy to do. And the, one of the cool things is, you can get all these, all the materials to do this for nothing. It's free. Um, there's a couple great websites. These are actually fee-based websites. You probably heard of AmesWed, EdCheckup, Dibbles. You probably heard of. That all costs a little money. These, Intervention Central, Easy CBM, are free. Doesn't cost you a thing. Um, has anybody ever used either of those sites? See, it's a great site. It's a fabulous site. Let's see if. Um, okay, there's, if you're not familiar with it, there's Easy CBM. It's free. All you have to do is go in and apply for it. You log in. It's got a home, I'm on the home page now. There's a page for students where I can list all my students in my class. There's a page for the measures. So let's say we're teaching fourth grade. We need to be able to generate reading passages, right? So look, uh, go to fourth grade, reading fluency passages, multiple choice, math number C. All the measures are there for me already. 
All I have to go and do is, if, give, is get a copy for me and a copy for the student. So let's say we use this. This is the copy for the student. And I give this to Jeremy and I say, okay, Jeremy, we're going we're gonna to do our reading now. What I want you to do is look at this reading passage. We're gonna, you're going to have a minute to read. Do your best work. When I say go, go. Press the stopwatch, have them read for a minute, and then you follow along on your own copy. Let's go back here. And you can see my assessor copy has the directions. This story about Victor, Joe, Jim, and Tom. I want you to read the story to me. I have one minute to read as much as you can. When I say begin, start reading a lot of the top of the page. Do your best reading. Do you have any questions? Start the timer. Say go. When this, while, while the student is reading, anytime he gets a word wrong, mark it. Just put a slash through it. When the student go, gets to a stopping place, after a minute, just say stop. And put a little mark there. And it, the words are counted up for you. It's very easy to count them up. You're done. Takes a minute, a minute a week to do that. And that will give you the most possible, the, the most accurate, reliable, valid data on student reading that you will find, that you can collect in, in one minute's time. Um, I'm also able to enter scores. So all I have to do is enter what they did. This will make a graph for me. So if I don't want to go to the time of making my own graph, this will make a graph for me. This, that, this is a fabulous website. Um, now, let me, uh, Intervention Central is another great website you can gather this kind of information on. And by the way, um, I'm going to be sending this to Pete and, uh, and Jolly and everyone, the handout, because I changed it a little bit so you can get it from them. Intervention Central is, is just kind of like a, it, it's got a ton of really cool stuff in this. This was actually developed by a school psychologist in Syracuse uh, who wanted to have some way that his teachers could measure student progress. Now it's his full-time job. That's, I mean, and he's got people working for him. But it is an amazing, amazing tool. Um, and so they have... Not only they have a lot of good reading materials here, they have behavior rating scales. You know, I was a teacher of youngsters with emotional behavioral disorders, and I needed to measure progress in behavior. They have behavior rating scales. They have a really cool feature called Chart Dog, where you can chart behaviors. They have a Dolch word uh, fluency list, early, early math fluency list. You can generate all your materials just from this website. It doesn't cost a thing. There's been research that shown in reading standards that just simple oral reading fluency is, correlates more highly with reading standards than any other test you can give. So, yeah, and that's a, that's a very good question. And I'm sure that will happen, especially I, I think now with a common core, you're going to see a lot more of these type of sites. So the materials are there. I mean, you can get them for nothing. Back when I was teaching, and I don't know if people use these anymore, but we used to use what are called basal texts. I don't know, I mean, if your school districts use them. I would just use the basal. I'd make my own. I'd Xerox off a page for the kid and one for me, and I'd, I'd use that. But now you can go on to Intervention Central and generate your own. The important thing, of course, is they have to be all about the same level. Because you can't give a sixth grade one day and a first grade the next and a fourth, because you're going to get all sorts of odd scores. You have to have about the same level. And kind of interesting, but we know from research is you should choose levels that are a little above your kid's reading ability. So if they're reading like on a, you, on a second grade level, if you choose like a third grade level, that, that works fine. Just so it doesn't frustrate them because they have more room to grow. If you choose something that's too easy, they grow, t they, they get to the top real quickly, sealing out. Now, um, just a few examples. Let me, uh, okay, example of, of reading. We've been talking about oral reading fluency. And again, you can get the online reading passages. You can use your school's curriculum. When I've used school curriculum, like I said, because we didn't have uh, things like EasyCBM, 
in the 1980s, but uh, I, in 1990s, I would just use my basal. I would say, say we, uh, we used Houghton Mifflin, and uh, they have a, they, in our series we had a book called Wind Chimes, I remember. And one of my students, third grade level, that's fourth grade text, so I would copy a page for, Jerem, for the child, I'd copy a page for me, and I'd give it to him. I'd go through those exact instructions. Jeremy, I want you to read for one minute. Do your best reading. If there are any questions, go. Time, hit my stopwatch, time for a minute. On my copy, mark the words he didn't get right. Put a slash through the wrong words. Count them up, graph them, boom, done. Um, and do the same thing next week and the week after. All you need then is you need the materials, either easy CBM or like I said, I used um, my basal text. You need those directions, which you can get off easy CBM. And then you need some scoring rules. You need to figure, well, what is an incorrect word? Well, obviously, if the word is weather and they say um, when, that's incorrect. But what happens if they repeat words, if they say, uh, weather, weather. They say it twice. You don't, it doesn't matter. Just so they said the word right, correctly. If they got the word correct, you mark it correct. Um, if they repeat it, that doesn't matter. Just so they had the word correct. Um, scoring rules are real easy, but they're also on easy C CBM. Uh, when you go to that website, it has a whole little section on, on uh, scoring. Now, uh, the important thing is these, the materials, whatever you use, they have to be standard. So you have all these things. You have Jeremy's copy. I have my copy. I have a pen for scoring, a watch clock or timer. I'm looking at the sweep hand, and I have the administration script. That's all I need to do the scoring. The important things about uh, scoring is you just need to be, uh, you need to do the same thing every time. So, um, and you need to do it over time. You need to do this every week. So one of the important things is you're going to need a new passage each time. If you do it once a week and you did the same passage, they're going to get pretty darn good at it. If you do a different passage every week that's on the same level, that's what you need to do. Now also, some of the, it is good news that over about 20 weeks, maybe even less than that, maybe like 15 weeks, you can start repeating because they won't remember over that length of time. So you could go back to Easy CBM and just use the, uh, the first ones you had. Each reading has to be cold. That means I'm not going to give the child a chance to practice. I'm just going to say, here's your passage, got one minute to read, any questions, go. So each reading has to be cold. Um, they have to be about consistent difficulty. That's where you want to use Easy CBM Intervention Central because they, they are the same difficulty. Or even if you use a basal text. A basal text go for about one year from the beginning. They show about one year's growth. So you could maybe select from the middle and the ending and the beginning to mix it up. But if you use um, different levels of difficulty, the data is useless then. Now, let me give you an example. This is what we did on Alex. Okay, he had five readings. We started out the year, he did five readings. 42 words, 28, 52, 47, 48. You need to find the median. You know, the median we know is better than using the mean. What's the median there? You just line up your numbers from the lowest to the highest, pick the one in the middle. That's your median. That's your baseline. Now once you have the baseline down, any math whizzes, what's the median there? 47, okay. So here's Alex. Weeks. So we said 47 is the median. Now I have the median. That's like my baseline. That's where he's starting. 
So I'll say that's where Alex is starting. The next thing is you write your, uh, you can actually use this information to write your present levels of performance. Like something like, given randomly selected passages from grade four reading curriculum, Alex will currently reads 47 correct words per minute. That's my present level statement. Now I can make my an measurable annual goals from that. How, how much do you want kids to grow? Here's what we know about young kids. That a realistic goal is a g growth goal is about two words per week. And it gets less as they grow older. But, and very ambitious is three. So essentially after second grade, just expecting one word growth per week is a pretty reasonable growth expectation for a child. So I just count. Say I have, well, I only did six here. Let's say I, have, I would never do this, but six, six weeks left. I expect six uh, more words. So I just mark my X there. That would be my measure. I could write a measurable annual goal on that. Here's another. So if we, uh, say we have 36 weeks, one word per week, we expect him to grow 30 words, 36 words per week. That's the rate of, imp our rate of improvement is one word per week. For 36 weeks of a school year, we could do that and we could figure out what our goal would be. And we could write, I'm, okay, thanks. And we could write our goal based on that. Then you create your graph for the whole year. Here we have Alex at the beginning. He's at 40 and where we want him to be at the end of the year. Figuring that out using our rate of growth of one word per week. And we can write our goal. Given randomly selected passages from grade four reading curriculum, Alex will read 84 correct words per minute. That would be our goal. Graph that once a week. We ask him to read. We count the words. We put them on the graph. And that's where we monitor the student progress. Let's see. We talked about this. Now we also have to have this. We, the last thing we need to have is we have to decide if we need to make an instructional change. Because that's the real essence of progress monitoring. And how you do that, you just eyeball it. You just look at it. And generally, uh, research has shown if you look at the last four data points, if they're above, you're great. If the last four data points are below, you need to make some sort of change. What is the change you're going to make? Well, that's up to you. That's up to your expertise as a teacher. Okay. Um, and there's my last picture I had. This is an example of a child actually from the Minneapolis public schools where we used oral reading fluency. And Minneapolis, because all kids are taught with that, we also have peer scores. We started him here. Here's his baseline. We figured out one word per week. That's where we wanted to be at the end of the year. And just once a week, we just graph and we see how he's doing. And we make our decisions based on that. The great thing is you're, you're going to be a better teacher. We know that because teachers who use this have kids that achieve on about a grade level more than teachers who don't. Also, that's perfect accountability. Your IEP is ever questioned. If there's ever any kind of court case, that's proof that you have uh, conferred educational progress. In essence, that's a a bulletproof IEP. As I was saying earlier, I mean, this is really easy stuff to do. I just wanted to give you a feeling for how it works. Um, go on to Easy CBM. I mean, all the training materials are there. It's so easy to do. It, your kids do better, and you have accountability built in. So, so it's about time now. Uh, thank you very much. And I just wanted to mention we were honored by having Slash. The faux slash here without his guitar and long hair. So thank you very much.